No microphone, right? So I just speak to people, right? Just right. Okay. talk loud. <laughs> Project. Okie dokie. Okay. I want to say a little bit more about myself, but I want to thank Wayne first. I want to thank Wayne, and I know about Wayne for a long time. I'll tell you what, I've been looking at American Ceramics for 40 years. And Susan is terrific. She showed me the collection today, which is awe-inspiring. It's a beautiful collection. So it's a thrill. I knew about Alfred for a long time, but at least I'm here today because in my earlier life I had to write about painting exhibitions. And I did 12 exhibitions on the Pennsylvania Impressions of some big museum family, too. And I'll tell you, when I started with Redfield, my, I'm doing the catalog raisin A and Edward Redfield is one of the Pennsylvania Impressionists. In the 80s, anyone was between 20, 10 to 20,000 today, the same paintings, three to 400,000 for the same exact paintings. So, you know, I, I think that ceramics have a big future in, in terms of appreciation of the public. You just have to keep on educating people. And I hate to make a relationship between money and art, but I, I think that this people should be collecting this stuff. It's really, really important to collect it and to support it young artists that can do that. So anyway, um, I got interested in ceramics uh, at Rutgers, which is a great period. Kak Kwang Kui was there at the same time. I visited his house in Caldwell, and I saw the Roy Lichtenstein things he had. Rutgers had a great period in the 50s that some major people were there in the 50s. And uh, I studied with Marlon Adelberg. I took his uh, craft design course. And if you don't know him, he's the one who did the Princeton show, wrote about the arts and crafts movement. He did the ceramic section. So he knew really a lot about arts and crafts ceramics. And uh, my paper for him, which was probably, I threw it out years ago, but it was on Adelaide Rock, the Oriental influence on Adelaide Brahma. So, uh, but I appreciated her work. It was beautiful. So I've been. Um, so I've been interested in ceramics for a long time. In the 90s, I did a series of articles. The first, one of the first was on Francis Zanska, who was Peter Volkis' teacher. Peter Volkis and Rudy Gordia, Michael McTwiggan, I wrote it for him then. And then I stopped writing because I got too busy with painting exhibitions and things. And then I got interested in Waylon Gregory. It was Waylon Gregory. His estate was very close. I remember I went to a gallery in New York City in the 90s. I saw one of his works, and I paid an exorbitant price for Wayland Gregory's statue. Not knowing, I was living in Wachung, New Jersey at the time, that just across Route 22 was the warehouse full of them. You know, but after that, I bought them from the warehouse, you know, from, his, from the estate. And there were two women running the estate, and I'm an art dealer too, so uh, they asked me to sell some Wayland Gregory stuff. But the, the painting people don't understand Wayland, well, but they saw my enthusiasm and they bought his work anyway. So that's what, what started. And, uh, and, and then they faded out. One lady died and the other lady relied on me more and more, and I thought it was important to do a book. So I figured out a way to do a book on him. A lot of people tried before, but none of them had any success. There's a whole list of people who tried. And for some reason, uh, it never happened until I did it. So I was very committed to Wayland Gregory, and uh, and it's in my backyard. He worked right about 15 minutes from where I live in New Jersey. So it was great, and I always write about artists from New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I don't think I think artists are very good in your own backyard. I don't think you necessarily have to find them in your recreation. I think there's some very good American artists right right near you. So don't overlook them. So turning back to Wayland Gregory. Um, this is an amazing piece. Uh, it's uh, the Rhine Maidens. It's found in Rhine Maidens found in Rhine, where Calvin Potter is. Uh, I don't want to go into all the details. He came from Kansas, and uh, he was a child genius. He was very good at playing the piano. He, he, he patented, or whatever music people do, five years old, a piece of music called Kitty Wobble, a piece of jazz that he wrote when he was five. And then he told his mother he wouldn't do Mozart anymore, just Waylon Gregory musical pieces. <laughs> <laughs> like six years old. So he was like a child genius. He went to the normal school in Kansas, in Pittsburgh, Kansas. The mother, with Italian and Spanish background, nothing like the waspy father, left her husband and the other children to go live in Pittsburgh with Waylon Gregory. I mean, she left the whole family to be with her son in, in, in Pittsburgh. I mean, that's how devoted she was. That, his him and, and art, you know. And he was lucky to have his Miss Bauman, who was a teacher in Pittsburgh, 
And she had been a student of Laredo Taft in Chicago. And that's very important, because Laredo Taft was a major teacher of American sculpture. And he was very important at the Chicago Exhibition in 1893. He did major stuff uh, at the Columbian Exposition. And his students at that time were women. He was really attracted to women students. He, uh, Janet Scudder and Bessie Potter Bonham, you can see the works of the Metropolitan, they were his students at the time. And he was a great teacher. I and mean, if you want to know how to do the nude figure, which is the basis of Western art, he was the one to study. He really knew. He was a great teacher. Not so much the greatest artist in his own right. He was a great teacher. He got the ideas. And you can still see his studio in Chicago today. It's still open. And it was an exciting area because Frank Lloyd Wright was right there too, at the same time. Midway Gardens, it was right there. Um, so uh, Chicago was very important, and he was supposed to uh, live with in the studio of, um, of Laredo Taft for, for uh, 15 months, and he wound up spending three years there instead. So he did his first early work. His first works were not in ceramics. He did plaster rooms, he did the Aztec room uh, in Kansas City in the President Hotel, and that's been taken down. But the theater in uh, St. Joseph's, Missouri, has this ancient, uh, ancient Middle Eastern art, like the Lamasi, these big uh, animals that are like bull with wings and human heads with beards. That's the kind of decoration on a huge scale for this theater. So he worked in plaster. One of the first things he did in granite, a statue for a park in Missouri of a pan made out of granite, directly carving in granite when he was a teenager. And, uh, and, uh, and then, uh, somehow, after learning all this stuff, and not doing anything in ceramics, he had met Guy Cowan. Now, Guy Cowan is very important because he's another Binns medalist here. He went to Alfred, and he knew all about ceramics, and he had a family business. He wanted to know how to make them better. And, and I'll tell you, Cowan's earliest work was boring. The vases he made are boring. He got better as time went on. And he got a claim for doing these bowl sets with little dancing girls with scarves. And he won some prizes at the Cleveland Museum for these little bowl sets. But, you know, uh, ceramics people think these are wonderful. But if you show the, show the same thing we all knew to sculpture people, they'll say, oh my god, like, there's no contrapposto here. You know, this, it's not good from a sculptural point of view. So he knew he was limited in terms of sculpture. He tried to study sculpture, got down. But he found a better thing. He just got Doug Whalen and Gregory to work for him. So he taught Gregory all about how to make ceramic, how to have the ceramic processes. And he had a factory. You know, he had the Cowan pottery. The Cowan pottery was the last major American art pottery, really, from the arts and crafts movement, period. And uh, it started in the teens. And uh, because of the Depression, it went out, it, uh, was, uh, went out, it was bankrupt by 1929. But you could be doing things for another two years, so it wasn't until the end of 1931 when the factory stopped. And in the last years, they did better work than they had done in all the previous years. The most amazing work was done in the five last five years of the pottery, which is amazing. You know, they have flat over their head, and that's when they decide to do really good work. And some of the classic pieces, like Victor Schreck and Ghost Jazz Bowl, is from the end. It's from 1931, <coughs> when the Depression started. So it was an amazing period, and, uh, ben, and uh, uh, Cowan was a wonderful teacher. You've got to consider he's one of the major teachers in American ceramics, who was a student's work. He taught Gregory himself, but not as a student. And then he had Shrek and Ghost, and the whole Cleveland School uh, ceramics for his students. And they did some of them the designs for the pottery. As it was closing, it's really, they were doing fantastic work, winning prizes at the Cleveland Museum when there was a depression and things were closing up. So this is a really large piece, and there's two of these. This is the Rhine main fountain, and he did three operatic themes. Um, this one is 29 inches high by 34 inches wide, so it's a big piece, and it relates to those three major fountains after this. And uh, this one is in the Wolfsonian in, my, in uh, South Beach. And there's another one in the Cleveland Museum, so there's only two that I know of, and they might be it. So it's a big project. I don't know what Cowan sold this for. And there are two, um, two seahorses that scored water at it that they didn't have at the Wolfson. So it was a set. Really. So the Rhine Maidens is an interesting story. The Rhine Maidens for Wagner's uh, ring cycle. They're at the beginning of the ring and at the end of the ring. 
they represent nature. And uh, they have the gold, the nature, you know, like oil and things, the, the, the richness that nature has in the Rhine River. Helbrecht, who is a dwarf, ugly dwarf at that, wants, uh, likes, likes the way these girls look, and uh, they try to tease him. And then, of course, they dump him. So that upsets Albert very much. He steals the gold, and that starts the whole ring cycle, you know, the whole pro problem. Stealing the gold from nature, really. And it's resolved at the end of the cycle, because at the end, uh, Brunhilde uh, has a torch. She burns the world ash tree. Valhalla tumbles, like the end of World War II, kind of. And the Rhine maidens get back their gold. So nature is gets back the gold. So that's what the you know the whole story. I don't want to talk about three hours long about the story of Rhine, the Rhine, the Rhine gold. But that's it. So there are two versions of this, and it's really the first to have his interest in fountain figures. Now where did he get interest in fountain figures? Okay, this is in Chicago. This is huge. That's a car in the lower right hand corner. This is by Laredo Taft. This is the Fountain of Time. And it's a huge thing based on a poem. And it's really late, it's from 1920. And I think Laredo Taft is working a Beaux Arts style from the end of the century. And Waylon Gregory thought this style was out of date already as a student. But he learned how to do the figure from him. You know, he learned how to do sculpture. So this is enormous and uh, and I think a major influence on Gregory because he did fountains the whole also, Laureate Taft did, did found throughout his whole career. And that was an influence on Gregory. Now, I don't know how uh, Gregory met Guy Cowan, but there was an exhibition at Macy's in early 1928. And Macy's was like the Museum of Modern Art at the time, believe it or not. They had major sculptures there. They had Archipenko, they had uh, John Flanagan. And Wayland Gregory exhibited a Salome there. And I don't know if it was made out of pottery or not, but they had a lot of Cowan pottery at that exhibition too. And I think that he probably met Guy Cowan there. And Guy Cowan said, gee, you know, I finally got somebody to do sexy female nudes. You know, and uh, so Waylon Gregory moved to Cleveland at the end of 1928. And this is one of the first pieces, um, it's in the show. Also, there's one in Cranbrook, right? I'm not Cranbrook, at the University Museum right now. Another version is that, and that's the only two versions I know. And then there's a black version he did later on at Cranbrook. So it's a very, very rare statue. And the collectors of Cowan Potter are always wondering, how much is this is worth? I said, don't bother me with this. Enjoy the statue. Don't worry about what it's worth. You know, really. But some people think that things are more valuable. I'm an appraiser, but I hate to think that things are more valuable than better. It's not true. The same pieces. It's just ridiculous prices that change every day. But uh, this is a story of Salome, another one from opera. This is uh, based on Richard Strauss's opera Salome, not the Oscar Wilde one that you know was really scandalous with, with illustrations by Beardsley. So this is the opera, which is also scandalous. Because of the scandal at the Metropolitan. Could you imagine a, an opera being scandalous at the Metropolitan Conservative Metropolitan Opera, but Richard Strauss's Salome was? Of course, it came from the Bible, the story, but it's about sex and violence in a big way. <laughs> and I jokingly always say it's a story of a Jewish princess that wanted to get ahead. <laughs> so here she is with the head of St. John the Baptist. And what I like is the wave. What's really unusual about it, he elevated the bottom by having this wave. And in the opera, because uh, I've seen it several times, Richard Strauss's Salome, the head comes up from the cistern, and the whole music changes. And she grabs the head on the silver platter, and she's elated. And this is what she wanted all her life. She wanted St. John wouldn't pay attention to her. He kept on telling her to repent, and she didn't want to repent. She wanted him. So she finally got the head, and the music swells. So this is really when the music swells when she gets the head. And she has a wonderful moment when she kisses the severed head. And she got her wicked. I mean, it's not that Salome didn't love. She loved crazy and too much. But, you know, it's about love gone astray, really. And, uh, and of course, he's a religious man, Jesus' cousin. So, and here she is. And uh, it, it, it's, it's like her dark victory when she gets the head. And then her father gets repulsed and puts her to death. You know, Herod gets upset and puts her to death. So this is the first major ceramic sculpture. And he did work for the Theological Seminary just before this, too, in Chicago. 
Another operatic theme, the last one I'm going to show you, is from Faust. I can go to this is a French opera, not a German one. And this is Margarita from Faust. And in her arms, she has a baby. She has an illegitimate baby in this opera. And he depicts her as the wind buffeting her and the baby. Uh, you know, uh, the devil is trying to trick her into uh, doing bad things. So the baby, she doesn't care for properly, the baby dies. So it's really kind of sad, but the opera doesn't dwell on that so much. What's interesting is it's in a movie from the period. It's in, um, it's in The Divorcee. Anybody see The Divorcee? It stars Meryl, Meryl uh, what's her name? Norma Shearer. Norma Shearer. So it's Norma Shearer. And when she says that she's having an affair, you know, she's an adulteress, the camera focuses on this for a whole minute when they're talking. It's really so. They were very well aware that this operatic theme is about adultery. So um, it's, it's a wonderful piece. So oh, this is at the Cleveland Museum showing their piece. I just like this photograph. So here's the Cleveland Museum's version of the Rhine Maidens. On the right is a Victor Schrecken ghost of uh, uh, Jonah and the whale. The little tiny figure on the back is Jonah, and we got the big squirt of water on top of the whale. And on the left is Walter Sins. I'm not the greatest fan of Walter Sins. It's Jacob and the Angel fighting. I like Paul Bogate better, but that's a whole different story. So. Okay, another famous one that he did for Cameron was the Norge Dancer. And in, um, after 1929, this relates to a famous Ziegfeld Folly star. Anybody know who this would be? Somebody said Fanny Bryce, ha ha, like Fanny Bryce would dance like this. But anyway, who do you think this could be? Anybody? It's not uh, Ruth Edding, you know, button up your overcoat. No, this is, um, this is Jill DeGray. So Jill DeGray lost her money in the stock market crash. And because of that, she had to perform for a whole week in Cleveland. And uh, when she was performing in Cleveland, she led Waylon Gregory stand in the wings and, and uh, made drawings of her dance. And her face is really nothing. This is not a portrait. It's a portrait of her dance. And later on in the 60s, he wrote about this. It's based on an Asian Indian dance, the Norge dance. And it said in the 60s, he wrote, and it published this in a paper, during the time I lived in Cleveland, the late Jill de Grey came to town for a week's performance. Here was a master artist, he wrote. This was uh, published August 5th, 1951. He said her oriental Norge dances were a complete surprise and revelation of art to me. Her costumes for the Norge dances consisted of diaphanous veils over her head and shoulders. On her arms and ankles were bells and Hindu jewelry of fantastic design. She wore gypsy-like voluminous skirts that flattened and swirled. One was covered with black mirror discs sewn on the material, so that as she danced in the spotlight, thousands of reflected stars were projected all over the theater. So it's really interesting because as she's dancing, the skirt is bouncing up and down kind of. Really very interesting. Uh, this was mostly in white. This was his personal one. The black ones are ones he made for himself, so it's like an artist proof. These were limited edition statues that Cowan could or for higher prices versus the production stuff that they're doing. So this was a limited edition of 50. I'm not sure they even made 50 of them. But this one was made for himself. It came from his estate. And here's Jill DeGray herself. Beautiful lady. And it says, to my favorite sculptor. And uh, she's interesting. And uh, very art deco, her outfit, too. And then I was researching this one. This is the burlesque dance, which shows, I think, his friend Alexander Archipenko, the Russian uh, sculptor. We did some work in ceramics, too, in the 30s, you know, in upstate New York. So they knew each other. But anyway, uh, this, I, I figured, who, who's the, you know, who posed for this one? And uh, an early title for this was The Shimmy. So if you look up in dance history, The Shimmy was invade and invented by Jill de Grey. And she had to uh, do a performance, and she had to sing the Star Spangled Banner, and she forgot the words. <laughs> so she didn't know what to do, so she started moving around. She didn't move her legs that much, but she was doing these sexy movements, 
and that became the basis of the shimmy. So she's also the source of this one. This is a different kind of story. This is another Talon piece that's kind of sad. This is called The Beaten Dog, which shows another side of Waylon Gregory. This one was not popular. There's only two of them known. And, uh, and he did an article called A Stray Pop Struggles into Immortality. And this story is from 1962, but this happened in the 30s. And the little dog was cowering on the highway where it had been cast away and lost. I brought it home to the studio to nurse it back to health and wrapped it in a warm towel by the fire. Hunched up there, afraid and grateful, it feebly kissed my hand and touched my heart. It seemed to represent to me all the loneliness and despair, the poor and miserable and homeless of the world, the epitome of rejection and the tragedy of life. The dog had no proud pedigree, Barry, not even a collar or license. It was just a plain, nondescript little homeless dog that somehow came into being in the mystery of the world. It was suffering and I could help it. And it occurred to me that I could do more. I would sculpt it in its humility and praise it as a living thing, a creature of feeling and suffering and capable of gratitude, joy, and love. And that's what his personality was like. It really was. And very, very hard to find today. And I love the way the glaze looks like the dog is wet like wet on the side of the highway. And people ask me, what's this? I, I don't care what it's worth. It's just wonderful. Okay, this is the other side that Gregory didn't like so much, but it's a very interesting subject because it's a flamingo. And I did some research into flamingo uh, design. Let's see. So flamingo, uh, the flamingo uh, ceramics were first made in the 40s, commissioned by Florida's Cavalier Hotel for guest rooms. That's the first time ceramics are known to be made of flamingo, but this is from 1930s, way before. And then the plastic ones, like in, um, you know, like in pink flamingos, they started in the 50s, the lawn flamingo. So Wayland Gregory is way ahead of his time. And this one and the heron show up in Florida, you know, uh, there's a lot of them that were in Florida. And this was commercial, so it was cheaper to buy this one. Uh, it's in a bowl, and a, it's a flower farm for us. So you can put water in the bowl and put little uh, stems of flowers all around the flamingo. And if you wanted, it had a pair of matching candlesticks. And these were like mass-produced. It doesn't even have his name on it, we know it's what and uh, the glaze is very unusual. Cowan called it had wonderful glazes. The Cowan company they called this Oriental Red, and uh, it's like a crimson color. It's in the show, and although it's the cheapest piece in the whole show, people love it. And um, the glaze is interesting because it had a uranium glaze. They're not the only ones to do a uranium glaze now, but orange and yellow glazes you have to watch out from the 30s and 40s because they often had uranium in them. And I use a black light in this, it doesn't work anymore. It's not, it's not glowing in the dark. It really doesn't. But the United States government stopped in 1942. They were no longer allowed ceramic artists to use uranium. So it's an interesting story in terms of light. And here's the other piece. Uh, this is the heron that he did, which is rare today. The other one was uh, you know, popular. This one is hard to find. I have to tell you how I found it. Uh, this is not from his estate. I was in Dania, Florida, in an antique shop, and these people, it was in a pile of junk, and it said on it, W. Gregory, but in the glaze, the people thought it said West Germany. So I bought it for a really good price. <laughs> so don't, you got to look in these thrift shops and things. But it's a very art that also, there are pieces in his estate that didn't get produced by Cowan. He did a famous vase with squirrels in the Metropolitan. It's in the Ellison collection from the same year. This is 1930. And these are kind of like bookends, but these are unique. They're in photographs, too, and they say Wayland Gregory, 1930. And they also have a wonderful Art Deco style. I think you probably know, I, I know some of you are more advanced, but I can't assume everybody's advanced. The Art Deco got its name later on for a show that happened in Paris in 1925. Uh, the exposition, this Arts et Decoratifs in Paris, where it got its name. 
So very much in the Art Deco style and these kind of animal things. And he loved animals. He had big dogs, he had cats, he had toucans, he had monkeys, he had peacocks, he had every kind of animal. Uh, he loved animals. No children. He loved children, but didn't have any. Instead, he had a menagerie. Then uh, the town closed, and he moved, got a terrific job, it seemed, uh, not north of there, at Cranbrook, which was just starting, and they hired him to start the ceramics program. And he was there for a year and a half, and at Cranbrook, you had to support yourself by getting students. You, know, you were paid for teaching, but you had to find them, so you, know, you had to go to the girls' high school and pass around pamphlets and all this kind of embarrassing stuff. And, Anyway, this is a very classic one. The print shop at Cranbrook made this one for Waylon Gregory. And he was smart. George Orr did this too. He had his pieces photographed before they were glazed. Because that way you could see what they look like. The glaze covers up the details. And this way, you know, you could see the figure much more clearly. And it's very modern. It's the girl with the olive, uh, based on Brancusi, really, I would think. And the olive relates to ovulation, I'm sure. It's about sex and reproduction naturally. So, and here she is, the finished version of the And you can see why he, he did. He wanted to photograph her before she was glazed in black and white. And I think it's great. Every kind of drip on this drips in the right place. Uh, this uh, the uh, Ceramic National started in 30, 32 at uh, the Syracuse Museum. The first year was really for New York New York area artists you know, from the Rochester, the whole this area. But starting in 33, they had ceramicists from all over the country, and he won the prize in 33 for this statue, uh, Girl with the Olive. And, uh, and then after that, he was often a juror, so if you're a juror, you came with prizes. But they did a very interesting display of this stuff for every year for about 10 years at the, at the different ceramic nations. And this is the most famous piece that Waylon Gregory did in the 30s. This is called Kansas Madonna. And in the 30s, you have an art style that's called regionalism, like Thomas Hart Benton, Grant Wood, John Stuart Curry, and others worked in this style called regionalism about the Midwest, not about New York City. That was something new, not about New York City. It was about the plight of the farmers and the dust bowl and things that were bothering farm life. And he was from Kansas. And there was a magazine called Fortune Magazine. This was illustrated in the Christmas issue of Fortune Magazine in 1937. And the interesting person that saw this was Henry Fonda, you know, the actor. And he wanted to buy it, but it was $1,500. They said the price was really high in the magazine, and Henry Fonda couldn't afford it. But there's a connection that's today. And what happened was that Henry Fonda was shooting Jezebel with Betty Davis. And there was a clause in the contract that if his wife went into, his wife was staying in New York, she only trusted a New York City doctor when she was pregnant. And if she went to labor, they have to close down Betty uh, Jezebel so that Henry Fonda could go back to New York and then they would resume after the baby was born. And that's exactly what happened. So they closed down Jezebel and he went to New York for the birth of his daughter and it was Jane Fonda, who was born by Caesarea. And that time, cesarean was a big deal. Like she was in the hospital probably for three weeks at Doctor's Hospital on the East River in New York. So out the window, you know, Henry Fonda could have seen the boats and the harbor and everything else at the East River. And at his past time, he visited Waylon Gregory, who was living in Wittach in New Jersey. And he did two sculptures of him, fired in his kiln at, at, uh, at Elmwood Farm or White Goose Cotch, not at the Atlantic Terracotta Company. He had two smaller kilns. There, you yeah, can tell from newspaper clippings. So they were fired at his, at his place in the kitchen instead. So they built a real friendship, and uh, Henry Father tried his hands at three little sculptures, and I don't know whatever happened to them. One was a, a frog, one was a mouse, and it's some kind of a new, I didn't say what sex the new was, <laughs> but some kind of new. And uh, the fathers like to know where they are, but I don't know where they are. And I think they're lost. Unless Henry Father took them home and threw them out, I, heard, I had no idea. <laughs> He did buy one. He bought a new girl swimming. And uh, after he died, he went to his grandson, Jane Fonda's son, who's Troy Garrity, owns it today. And it was in the pool, so there's a, a water line on the statue because Henry Fonda put it in the pool, actually. So, um, oh, and I sold for the estate. I sold the larger portrait of Henry Fonda 
to the Everson Museum, and it's on display right now. So if you want to see the portrait of Henry Fonte, he did, it's on display now, as is um, what I'm going to show you. It's called Europa. Europa and the Bull, both of them are on display now. Everson. They wanted to show them when this show was at Alfred. You know, they wanted to cor make it correspond. Okay, Cranbrook, that was from Cranbrook. Can't sit down. You also got a little figure of a deer, which I think is adorable. It's a very crude porcelain, very, very crude porcelain. He's trying to make porcelain. Type of thing. And he said he left nothing. But then he went to Cranbrook, they had an exact duplicate of this. So he did leave behind one little sculpture, which they still have, but that's all he left behind at Cranbrook. Because uh, there was a situation with Bank Holiday, they, 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 they ruined all his stuff, and he sued. So, uh, so they did, he did leave behind, I guess, to show how humane he was, one little deer, and this is Paul Cranbrook deer. So then he moved to New Jersey, and that's when Henry Fonda visited him in uh, 1933, moved to New Jersey, and he started to move on a bigger scale. The first monumental, really big statue he did at the Atlantic Terracotta Company uh, is of this, of this, the swimmer, and the big version was exhibited at the Whitney. I think this version was exhibited at the Whitney, too. And unlike a lot of ceramic artists, he was accepted by the fine arts community. Uh, only Carl Walters and Wayland Gregory were really accepted by the Whitney. Shrek and Ghost and the other members of these Cleveland School Barns. But he did stuff that to the people looked like sculpture, no matter what it was. It looked like sculpture, not just ceramics. It really looked like sculpture. This is the most fantastic maquette that he did. Maquette is a smaller version for a bigger statue. And the, the finished version is uh, doesn't not covered with glaze like this. It has glazed areas. And uh, the big version was shown in New York City at his apartment. He had an apartment on Sutton Place. To sell to people in New York, department stores and things, he'd have a showing and apartments for people to see his stuff. In the center, the place was blue with stars, and in the center was a pool where the big version of this was, and there were ceramic fishes squirting water at her. He later on took the statue to his house in New Jersey. Now, he didn't keep the apartment forever, but in about five years he had his apartment in New York City. And the big version was the center of this, but I think this is the most successful of the maquettes that he did. And it sh begins to show his interest in glass. He's a major glass artist in the 30s, too. Corning has his works. And uh, he didn't blow glass, but he put it in the kiln. That's what they did. He was three major glass artists in the 30s, Frederick Carter, you know, Stuben, and Waylon Gregory, and uh, Maurice Heaton. They were the three leading glass people from the 30s. And so he's one of them. He's in, you know, he's in the books, the Craft Museum and everything. I wrote an article on it for uh, the Craft Museum. And um, I think it's online. I think you can see it online. So this begins to show it's not just glaze, it's getting to be glassy. And this interest in glass and ceramics keeps on going. And then he develops uh, this idea from one of the really monumental sculptures, the ton size, which is the gift to Alfred. And he developed the honey honeycomb technique, which if you saw this being put together, it's got little compartments of, uh, of clay, like a beehive has it. And then, so it has an internal infrastructure, and around it is the skin. And uh, he, he wrote about this, too, and how he did this. He knew that to make a standing statue, clay statue in the kiln that's hollow, you need to have an armature, which would be, uh, could be metal, which would melt, could be wood, which would burn, and the best thing to do was to make it out of ceramics. So that's his idea, keeping the ceramics inside the hollow statue so it would support itself. And then, while it was liquid, when it was being made, he kept it wet, I mean, spritzing it with water. And then, when it was finished, he let it dry for a period of time. And then he put it in the kiln, in his house. Uh, well, first in the Atlantic Terracotta. This was at the Atlantic Terracotta Company. And he would fire it for two, uh, two, uh, two weeks, for a two-week period. And uh, 
And this is so large, you see in the show, it was put in front of the Philadelphia Museum. The Ceramic National travels to Philadelphia that year from Syracuse. And this statue was photographed on the steps of the Philadelphia Museum. So she was there before Rocky on the steps of Philadelphia. <laughs> He's nothing new. You know, she was there first. So anyway, this is the back of her. Take by a painter from, from Allentown, Pennsylvania, named Richard Peter Hoffman. And his boyfriend was William Spallow, who's a ceramic sculptor. He also exhibited at the Nationals. So this is the back view of her. And that's Philadelphia, you know, in front of the Philadelphia Museum. Then the 30s is a period of the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. And he had three um, WPA projects. There are different WPA uh, organizations, uh, the federal, federal government did. There was, for example, the PWAP, which was more short-lived. It was the WPA, which was huge. They were the ones who did the post office murals. But the best part of the WPA on his letterhead, see, it says FAP, Federal Art Project. Those were the creme of the creme artists. They did differentiate and govern between people they thought were largely talented and super talented. So Gregory was the super talented part. And uh, this fountain, which is there today still, this is a painting he did to sell it to the WPA. Um, it was also funded by the local government, too. So the, uh, Mar the uh, oh, Middlesex County freeholders paid for half of it, too. So it was the freeholders and the federal government paid for this enormous statue. They hired three men to help them work in Atlantic Terracotta, ten men to help them. To work. And they were, you can tell by the names, they were all like Ukrainian or Polish, they were Eastern European men, gave them work in the, in the 30s. That was the idea, to give people work and teach them something they could use in the ceramics industry. Now that building is on the other side of the park today. It's in Roosevelt Park, and it was dedicated to Thomas Edison. And you can still there today, and the globe on top is terracotta, glazed terracotta. The figures, though, are aggregate, and they represent the good people the humanitarians, the scientists, the teachers. But around the base are the more interesting ones, which are the vices. So the virtues and the vices. So four of them are the horses of the apocalypse, you know, from the Bible again. So, you, and, uh, so that they would be pestilence, which is like disease. Um, pestilence, war, um, death, and a famine. So there are four horses of the apocalypse are on the bottom. And then he added two more, which would be uh, uh, gluttony and um, avarice, right? Avarice, okay. Greed, greed and gluttony. So uh, greed is two octopi that are strangling each other. And the other one is a hydra. You know, the hydra from Greek mythology sliced one head off like Hercules did and two grow in its place. And it relates to the stock market crash, because the faces are all stock market people from New York, and the tail of the hydra is the ticker tape. So it's all about the problems with the stock market, and stock market controls on society. So that's, these are the vices around the bottom part of it. I sold, there were maquettes for these six, I sold to Rutgers University, Rutgers School. And there's the fountain today. Hmm. It had been restored, they did a bad job, they spent over 100000 and it has to be restored again, I hate to say. And uh, there were chips in the corners, and they restored it like indoor ceramics, and New Jersey in the winter with, with the water and ice, not a good thing. And the World's Fair. Uh, the, the most major thing was the World's Fair in 1939, and everybody's making souvenir things. So he designed this plate, that's unusual that it's both modeled and molded. So the central part is Uncle Sam, that's the molded part, and it says, Yankee Doodle went to town, New York, 1939. What's important in his hand is the Trilon and Perisphere, designed by Wallace Harrison for the World's Fair in 39. The iconic images. And some people still remember the World's Fair. I asked my mother, did you see the World's Fair? She said, oh, yes, what'd you think? Oh, it was terrific. What'd you see? I don't remember, because she was five years old, you know, at the time. But she knew it was great. <laughs> she still knew it was great. So that's what he has his hands. He's a trion in the perisphere. Very, very art deco. Okay, and the famous thing he did was the Fountain of the Adam. This is the Fountain of the Adam at night. 
The fan itself was uh, designed by Nembold Cullen, and the, the terracotta, the 12 terracotta statues by Gregory, made now in his new house, he designed uh, his own house, and uh, today it's Warren, but it was Bamberg at the time, that was made, friends with Franklin Wright, was made on a cement block. Not a good idea for New Jersey. Anyway, so he had these huge brooms, really, that were killed. And to deal with these statues, he hired uh, African Americans, a father and son. And the father, uh, his name was Tyson, I don't know what his last name was, helped Mrs. Gregory cook in the kitchen. She was a lousy cook, and he helped her cook in the kitchen. Meanwhile, the son was posing for Gregory. And uh, I think he's the model for water that's at Cranbrook today. I just can't imagine him standing upside down on his head, nude, in the studio, but maybe that's what happened. <laughs> so on the top of the fan, so you have eight electrons, it's about the, uh, about the, uh, the octet theory of the atom, and on top of the four elements, two were male, two were female. Uh, the electrons, four were male and four were female, and on top, uh, the elements were, earth is always female, naturally, air was male, and um, and water was male, which was based on his assistant, really African American assistant, and um, and let's see, and, and air. So air, air, air and water were male, and earth and fire were female. And there's a version of fire in the show. And here's a drawing he did in his studio for water. And this is Ralph, his assistant. And here's Ralph in the, in the maquette. He did four maquettes of this uh, for the big statue for the World's Fair. And it's hollow like inside, as fire is. So the idea is that water and fire you could see through. So he wanted to make it like hollow inside. And here's the big version of water. And I think it's the best of This is in Cranbrook today. The best of the elements. And these were all the ton size. So you could see he had this dolly he had it on. And he also had uh, a Tyson and Ralph, they had a cousin who lived nearby too. So it would be four men moving these around. And they, they are very, very heavy. And this is Earth. And I think it's based on his wife. In this version, she looks pretty nasty. Probably is his wife. And uh, Yolanda. So she has a fierce look. Uh, she's an earth goddess. She is surrounded by minerals. And, um, and he said she was virginal, which is very, very weird because in mythology, earth goddesses are nothing but virginal. They're mothers. So why is she virginal? She sounds like his wife, actually. So anyway, she's kind of nasty. Right, so I want to go back. Let's see, back. No, we're in the wrong direction. Okay. This is the maquette for Earth, and it's beautiful, and she's not nasty looking. So this is a very, very good maquette of, of Earth, and I think beautifully done. I like the maquette better than the big version, actually. Beautiful face on this one. And you can see the minerals. Something like the one it's at, you know, it's at Alfred. It's something like, really, mother and child without the baby. <coughs> Similar kind. I like this one better than the finisher. And the electrons. The critics, the British critics, really like the electrons. They wrote a lot about them. And they thought there was a lot of sexual energy in these uh, electrons in, in the critics. And uh, this is on the cover of the book. And there, there were eight of these. And her eyes are very strange. They're like suspended in space, her eyes. And she's holding a lightning bolt on her head. So it's all about really atomic energy versus sexual energy. This is a beautiful one. That's at Richmond, University of Richmond Museums, and there's all these bubbles on the back of her. And these are the male ones uh, upside down. So uh, I think this is one of the best of the middle ones. There are only two male ones. Uh, the other male electrons, African American, and uh, as is water. So um, the critics, like I said, the British critics really liked it, and the head is hollow like that, just as with Mother and Child, which is kind of Viennese kind of influence.
Okay. And then, so going back after the fair, you know, he took the uh, figure from New York, the swimmer, back to his uh, house in uh, Warren that he designed for himself. And he decided to really start really fusing ceramics and glass together. And this is one of them, and you can see the line where the water was uh, in the pool. So this is something really new that he did, and you know, like I said, you can see these glass sparks at corning. And these are glass pieces by Wayland Gregory. But these are enamel pieces. He was friends with Vali uh, Wieseldier, who uh, uh, got cancer in the 40s, and used to spend the weekends with him and his wife in New Jersey, where they would help her. Uh, she couldn't take really strong medication like morphine when she was living in New York. On the weekend, she could take morphine and relax with Gregory and his wife. Uh, so she did this stuff in, in Austria. She did enamel glass in Austria, and then Gregory did it too. And so this was fired in the kiln. And you can see it's like transparent. The, the, uh, the antelope is transparent, like the one on the bottom is transparent. And very right there, but and then he did these pieces, which are direct uh, fusion pieces of glass and ceramics. And uh, he got several uh, lawsuits. He sued people for imitating him. And he patented, he patented. And on these pieces, there's a patent number usually on the bottom that you could look it up, US patent. And he patented the use of glass and ceramics together, fusion. So this is not glaze, this is actually glass. And people have done this since, you know, over the years, but it was really something new, and he wanted it for himself. He sued Otto and, and Gertrude Natzler for imitating this, he thought. He gave them a prize at the Ceramic National. He was the judge, one of the judges, and then he sued them. <laughs> <laughs> because um, he thought they were doing the same kind of thing. So they spent a weekend at his house, at Gregory's house in New Jersey. The Natzlers flew in from California, and they hashed it out. And from then on, the Natzlers didn't do works that looked like glass on ceramics. They did glass glazes, but not glass on ceramics. They came to an agreement. And then production pieces. He, he, also, uh, he also made uh, design porcelain pieces for leading department stores all over the country. And that went on for really 20-some years. Uh, I think an article just came out on his plates and platters, which were porcelain. And they were carried by the leading stores in New York, including America House, which was the American Craft Museum, as well as Tiffany's, uh, Bonwood Tellers, Lord and Taylor's, Altman's. They all carried his stuff. It's a very, oh, uh, Homaka Schlemmer. They all carried his stuff in New York. Also in Texas at um, Neiman Marcus, uh, Chicago at uh, Marshall Field, California and Honolulu, Honolulu at Gumps. So he was really all over selling these things for a long period of time. After a while, though, he originally made his plates himself, and they got to be very ubiquitous. He didn't want to keep on making porcelain plates, so he bought planks in the 40s. So he bought them and he decorated them. After he stopped making the monumental statues, he let the African-American guys go, and he hired a 16-year-old girl to help him decorate, this an Italian girl, to help him decorate the ceramics. And she always said she painted in the dots, and some of the pieces you can see like dots. That's what she did. But it's really not so much you think of like an artist, like a designer designing for, for production. Not really. He bought the blanks and then painted them himself. So it's really much more studio, even the plates, than, than, than industrial production. Although they were started out that way, they didn't end that way. These are molds he made of a toucan. He had two cans as pets and a rooster. And in the warehouse, I found the molds for these, and I destroyed them because I didn't want them to make them again. His family, uh, his grandnephew, did some beautiful stuff in Peru that you could buy at Neiman Marcus today. But I didn't want them using the same molds. I really wanted to make, let them design their own pieces, you know, and be influenced. But I didn't want them to use Gregory's molds, so I wanted to protect them. So I took a hammer and I smashed them up. So I have to protect this artist from his family. And this is a very famous one. Uh, this is probably unique. This is a blank that he bought. But it was shown at Hamaka Schlemmer in New York City. And the New York Tribune gave this glowing reviews. And as far as dinnerware, he's really important too. This is absolutely beautiful. It's 
the big, big fighter for, for, for seafood. And then he also did things like this. And he was not a racist at all, like some of the people in Cleveland, so I'm not going to mention names, but he, um, he did African things. He saw beautiful beauty in African designs. And this one has a fantastic, it's supposed to have a 24 karat gold blaze. That's kind of unique. And he said he fired this seven times to get the finish exactly right. And uh, the spear was a flag, like an American flag that you take the flag up and you use the, the pole as a spear. So uh, DC designed for mantles. And that's, that's it. So, you have any questions about this? <laughs> you must have some questions. Yeah. Tom, how big was that little dog? You had a very big photo, but okay. Yeah. Uh, it's on display at the. Uh, if you want to see his work for Cowan, you can go to Cleveland and see it at the Cowan Pottery Museum. It's a great museum. His work for. He did more designs for Cowan than any other artist besides Guy, Guy Cowan. And they're in these uh, these cabinets all over the library, and it's beautiful. Striking those punch bowl they have, and it's really worthwhile to see. If you're going to visit uh, Cleveland, uh, Cowan's house is there to say to see too. It's still there. Guy Cowan's house is still there uh, to visit. And if you like Victor Striking Ghost, which I do, I think he's great too. Here's the high school has a big ceramic mural of Paul Bunyan. So there is stuff to see for ceramics if you're interested in going to the outside. And also the Cleveland Museum has a Cleveland room, which has stuff on display too. The Western Reserve Society, opposite, they also have Cleveland School stuff. So it's very interesting if you want to go there to, uh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about his childhood? You know, I was reading in your book, and we're in Kansas, it was, but a little more about his family or how he grew up. And you said something in the book that he got interested in ceramics because he witnessed an Indian burial. That's right. And then I had this fantasy there were a bunch of Indians and he was like just five years old and that would have been amazing. Yes, he saw the making of it. He saw it in but I don't, I don't, you know, can you open up that story? Because I couldn't believe that he actually saw, he probably saw an excavation of it. Yes. No, he saw Indians making pottery. He saw it's Indians on a making pottery. Yeah, so, probably on a resume. Okay. Now, like the Plains Indians don't make pottery. So this group of Indians I think this must be unusual because Native Americans in the plains didn't make pottery. In the Southwest they made pottery. Yeah. You know, so that's that's when like later on you have uh, North Dakota School of Mines, Margaret Cable, you know, she was another Alfred person too. And uh, she was doing this Western kind of thing in, in North Dakota. And then she taught the Indians in South Dakota how to make pottery. They didn't know how to do it. She went to South Dakota and taught these three sisters how to make, uh, it's called uh, Pine, Pine Ridge Pottery. Taught these three sisters how to make pottery because the, these Plains Indians did not have, it's not part of their tradition. Don't forget, they're moving around. They're like nomadic. They're not, not stationary like they are in the Southwest. Well, when I read that passage, you know, I pictured this, this little boy hiding behind a bush, yeah. looking at these Indians yeah. burying the body uh, and pop. No, no, they all of a sudden he had to be no, interested no. in pots of he was, he was doing the ceramics at the same time as the burial, or at the same time. It had nothing to do with the burial itself, I don't think. It just happened to coincide with him. But he saw them making it and he got interested in it. You know? He was a natural for sculptures. He just saw that. And what's the story about his parents and polo ponies? Polo ponies. You know, there's the screen. Was there some connection between polo and... Well, see, Far Hills, I live in Far Hills, so I know this. The Schley Field in Far Hills. Far Hills is an elite community where the rich people live on the other side. I'm in the poor people community where doctors and lawyers live. But the rich people don't do anything. They live on the other side of the road. This was in Kansas where he grew up? No, no. The polo has to do with New Jersey. Oh, it has to do with New Jersey. Yes, and Schley Field, and he used to see the polo races. And today they do like selfie races. Today it's a big event in October. They have the stuff in the back of the car, and they serve champagne. You know, champagne and stuff like that. It's still there, but they don't have polo anymore. So he met a lot of rich people, you know, there. That's what he wanted. He wanted to find clients to buy his stuff. Of course. And then he did uh, a dinner set that's very famous that uh, Rena Rosenthal carried. It was illustrated. Uh, that was like the, the leading crafts place in New York City. 
she had Donald Esky, she had the leading designers in there. And she photographed his polo set that had the plagues that were hand, hand created and hand carved, and little polo figures too, you know, part of the set. Beautiful screen. Yeah. Well, the screen is the same period too. Yeah. These were these, these were uh, dinner service. So he wanted to do everything, and then the article I just did, he had a lawsuit with Lennox as well, because Lennox wanted to him to design things. And there is one little porcelain head that has the, Len the green Lennox mark on it, but they didn't want him to use his name. So he got very mad and he sued them. And two very famous vases they did have Waylon Gregory semi-nude females with stars behind them. Those are like identical to stuff that he did. So I'm sure they're Waylon Gregory's designs, but he didn't get the credit for it. They probably paid him, but they didn't get the credit for it. So that didn't work out. So interesting. Could you talk us through a bit more his initial education in ceramics know-how? Was it through Taft? No. Did he for the Taft didn't do it ceramics. Was in Kansas. Well, see, every uh, okay. If you're going to make bronzes, two ways to do it. You could do it through plaster, or you could do it through terracotta. You have a choice if you're a sculptor, and then you cover them with with wax, and you have the lost wax process. And what do you think is what? Do you, what do you think most American sculptors do? Do you think they use plaster or or terracotta? They use plaster because terracotta has to be fired. You have to have a different technology to do it, and they're lazy and cheaper, so they just make plaster statues. But a lot of them also the terracotta. Now, Laredo Tiff might have made terracotta uh, figures that he made molds out of, but he really didn't focus on ceramics at all. It was Guy Cowan. It was totally, he saw the Guy Cowan stuff at Macy's and it was Guy Cowan who got him involved with ceramics. And he was like a Dr. Ward with ceramics culture. And Cowan was a student at Alton. Yes, yeah. Tell him you didn't show the granite piece. Is there any record of... It's a small photograph, that's all we've been oh. looking for. It. Uh, after, after this, it's going to the Beach Museum in Kansas, which is near Missouri, and they're looking at parks in Missouri to see if they still have this granite statue of Pam. But that's very modern. It's hard to do carving in granite for a teenager. And uh, it's part of the American sculpture time. It's something called direct carving, where they were carving directly in wood and in stone. In the 19th century, the American sculptors would have a model, and the Italian stone carvers would carve it in marble. But in the 20th century, the sculptors were actually carving it themselves. Right. So he was right on target. That's what they were doing in New York. There's a lot of limestone carving in Kansas, direct carving also. Oh, really? I don't know about that. I'll tell you sometime. <laughs> okay. Okay. There, there used to be like people who were just like pack clay up and then would uh, try to like, just pack a solid piece of clay up and then start to carve it. What's interesting okay. about the way the Gregory thing is honeycomb stuff or the other stuff that almost looks like Peter Bocas, where here's a cylinder, here's a person trying to like move the things around. Well, you know, they knew each other, see, and I don't have any documentation, but I know from the estate that he was in contact with Peter Bocas. They were, they were acquaintances, and they were in contact. And he knew everybody in ceramics at the time. He knew everybody well. Right? It's interesting. Um, the other thing is, like, the, um, after I left Borknack, we went to a different gallery called Proshauer. Which was an old yes, gallery. I love Crasher. Okay. Yeah, it's Crash, I knew it. Huh? Which was a really old Whitney gallery. Yeah. And there's like a lot of really kind of interesting people. Uh, John Sloan. Have, John huh? Sloan. John Sloan. Maurice Prevagas. Yeah, it's like William yeah. Blackens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's looking at some of that stuff and trying to figure out how that stuff fits together. And why he wouldn't be? Why is he not in that group? Because he's more like regionalism. He's more like Thomas R. Benning. <laughs> he's later. Later. And he wasn't part of the New York Whitney set. Well, later on, he exhibited at the Whitney. He exhibited at Whitney. So did Carl Walters. The only two ceramic sculptors that were exhibiting at the Whitney. Carl Walters was the first. He's before Gregory. Yeah. And Carl Walters did the doors of the Whitney. The doors of the Whitney in New York, when they started out, were not ceramic. They were glass. They were uh, molded, like glass slump, slump molded. Put the glass on top of the mold and heat in the kiln and it goes into the mold. That's what put, that's what the doors of the wedding were. They were these glass panels put in a metal frame. And Carl Walters did that. So he must have had some influence on Gregory too, I would say, too. Just, you know, 
and Whitney was showing Carl Walters and Waylon Gregory, and a, just one statue by Bali Vicentier, who had some influence on American ceramic sculpture too, and she came. She was in Cleveland. Very interesting story about her. She was very famous at the Wiener Werkstatt. She studied the uh, Kunstgewerbe Schule in Austria, and uh, the Metropolitan had a show of ceramics. And after the success of the Art Deco show in Paris, the Metropolitan had, around 1928, a traveling ceramic show. And she went around the country with the ceramic show. And it's really interesting. In New York City, no one paid attention to the ceramic show. When it went to Cleveland, it had a big, big effect. People in Cleveland really loved the ceramic show, and she stayed for a period of time in Cleveland. And she worked at uh, the Supreme Pottery that's outside of Cleveland. She was not hired by Guy Cowan, but her stuff is important because she's a part uh, Bali Wieselt here. And she became very good friends with Gregory. He helped take care of her when she had cancer at the end. He did her hands. He sculpted her hands after she was dead. You know, so uh, it was a close relationship. She was tiny. Again. I lost the picture. Somebody went to the house and stole the pictures of Gregory and her. But apparently she was tiny and sat on his lap in pictures. Oh. How about, how about the, at Cranbrook and Carl Millis? He, well, they hated each other. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really ironic to me that Gregory is much more important in American ceramics than Carl Millis is in American sculpture. So, Primber paid a fortune for Saarinen, you know, was Scandinavian, and so was Millis from Sweden. So they gave him a ridiculous salary, ridiculously high. They begged him to come for six years because Saarinen wanted him. And he didn't have to teach. He just was on campus, and, and that was it. He didn't have to teach anybody or anything. You know, once in a while, critique something, and that was about it. And, you know, Gregory had to go and find people to take his courses in ceramics. And they treated him that poorly, really, because there was a conflict. There was a conflict because he didn't like ceramic sculpture. Then, according to Shiko Takezu, Maya Grotel said at Cranbrook when she got there, don't mention, everyone said there, don't mention the word ceramic sculpture, because they thought of Gregory and the conflict. So for Cranbrook, after Gregory left, the only thing that they wanted were vases. So she didn't do ceramic sculpture, so she wasn't about to start. However, if students wanted to do ceramic sculptures, my Grotel was fond of the students doing it, but she would never try it because she knew that Millis, I don't think that was her thing anyway, but Millis wouldn't like it. But he was very, very powerful at Cranbrook. How about the work of Henry Varner Poor in related to... Uh, they were friends. Uh, I, did, you know, I did an article on two sculptures he did for Radio City that Radio City didn't know that he did. So at the opening of Radio City, Henry Varnapur designed land bases that were stolen by the people that visited the theater. But in Roxy's apartment, uh, Roxy Rothfeld was doing behind the Rockettes. They were going to call them their Roxy X or something. They couldn't pronounce it, so they just called them Rockettes. He's the guy behind the Rockettes. In his apartment, they have all the furniture designed by Donald Esky. They have a tour today, you can see it. And on the furniture were two stu uh, sculptures by Henry Varnum Poor. Uh, one is at the Metropolitan in the Ellison Collection. One is Romeo and Juliet. And the other one is in a private collection depicting Ten Nights in a Barroom, which is a story about a morality play from the 19th century. And they were on display for less than a year in Roxy's apartment. And this is during Prohibition. So it's really ironic you have a prohibition statue when everybody's getting drunk in his apartment. You know, they're really drinking. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that that's the way it was. So they were friends. And um, they were in the same, at, at the Everson, at Syracuse Museum, they were in the same ceramic national as judges. And there are pictures of them together. But Henry Varnapurus also did some really early ceramic sculpture too. But he focused on plates and uh, pictures and things like that. He, but he was fabulous. He was, he was a painter. Yeah. You know, he did and the murals and he did architecture. I mean, he's really wonderful. His house is in disrepair because New York State is not supporting it correctly. I'm friends with his grand, his son. He gave a lecture. His son showed up. And uh, they really should take care of it. It's called Crow House. It's fabulous. He also designed for theater people houses, including uh, Burgess Meredith. We, we would, uh, Wayne and I would go to a house that was in uh, uh, Andrake, the, uh, the pirate, Al Rawson's house. Oh, and it would be Tony and the Pirates. Okay. Like, uh, like in Andrake. Okay. But it was, 
it had a studio and all kinds of stuff. Really? I don't know. It. The last major thing he did was for Helen Hayes, the actress, and we were poor. He did lead on the swamp today. It's in Penn State, in the middle of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. They have a new building, and people wouldn't support putting the statue, putting the fountain, out on display. And it's, it's his son is so upset. His son is just, it's unbelievable. The, the, the hardships he has supporting his father's stuff. It's really upset. And Waylon Gregory is the wolf of the easy one, one of the things really nice about this is the interrelationship of how all the people came in contact with him. And being in Kent State, uh, when I taught there, it, it was like really kind of amazing just to see. It's in the warehouse there, Penn State. Is that no, your in Kent State. Penn State. Kent State. Kent. Oh, no, Kent. No, no, Kent. Kent. Kent State. This is with a P. And Kent seeing State. the influence that he had on Cleveland, and the whole, kind of like, the whole Cleveland connection to the Wiener Bergstadt and all that stuff. That's Bali. Really, yeah, the influence of Yeah, Bali. that's really yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. He was terrific. He really was terrific. He did a nice job. No, thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> my whole life and I finally got here so it <laughs> yeah, great. finally happened better late than never right <laughs> all roads lead to Albert. all right <laughs>